folks. How are y'all doing today? Good to see you guys. Um, we're going to keep going and continue our way here through calculus and just see, make sure we're all um, on track and working towards that AP test. So today we're going to actually now transition. So we talked about limits at the beginning of the year. And we saw how limits allowed us to um, deal with derivatives or instantaneous rate of change. We're going to now look and see what happens if we go the opposite way. So for instance, let's take a couple functions just for the fun of it. And I want you guys to find the derivative of these two functions. So let's take f of x equals, let's go, x squared plus 7x minus 1. And I also want you to take the derivative of x squared plus 7x plus 3. All right, tell me what the derivative is for both equations. Why don't you pause the video real quick and take the five seconds it takes to do that. All right, so you guys probably came up with, matter of fact, I'm really hoping you came up with 2x plus 7 here. And on this one, you came up with 2x plus 7 as well. Again, the only thing that changed was the c value of these two quadratics. They just, just they had a different one. So we're going to come back to this idea here in one second. So what an integral is, well, first of all, we represent it with this mathematical symbol. This mathematical symbol right here, this is called an integrand. So what we're going to be looking at today is something called an integral, or more technically an, an indefinite integral. So, and that's also called an antiderivative. Indefinite integral. There we go. So this is technically an antiderivative indefinite integral, same kind of idea, same kind of thing. So what we end up doing with these is this integrand is it goes and undoes, undoes a derivative. So for instance, on these two derivatives up here, all we really used was the power rule. And just a quick reminder, the power rule is this. We just take the exponent. We take the original exponent and we multiply by whatever the variable is with the exponent subtracted one. So original exponent comes down and is multiplied and we subtract one. Well, an indefinite integral or an antiderivative well, it's going to do the exact opposite of the actual derivative. So I'm going to put some here in a second. I'll explain what this dx is here in one second. So first thing we did on the integrals, we, we brought down the exponent. Well, that'll be the last thing we do on our antiderivative. The last thing we did for our power rule on the derivative was we subtracted one. So the first thing we're going to do here is we're going to divide by or we're going to add one to our exponent. And then on our antiderivative, or our derivative, we multiplied by the original exponent. So here we're going to do the opposite. We're going to divide by our new exponent. No, it's, it's the exact opposite. Multiplied by the original exponent, so now we are going to add the new exponent. We subtracted one from our exponent, so we're going to add one to our original exponent. An antiderivative. Now, like I said, I'll add more to this as we go through. But the first thing I want to talk about is this right. This is called a differentiable. It basically means with respect to. So 
a differential right here. This is going to says we're going to integrate with respect to x. So x to the n, integrate with respect to x. So let me show you how this works. Say I take these derivatives, since it's the same derivative, and I wanted to undo that derivative. So we're going to undo this derivative. So we're going to do the antiderivative or integrate this derivative. So here's how this works. And remember, right now, this has an exponent of 1. So if I'm going to do the antiderivative, I'm going to take my term, and I'm going to add 1 to my exponent. So 1 plus 1 would be 2. And I'm going to bleh, divide by the new exponent. And now we have this 7. Now I want you to be very careful on this 7. So I'm going to come back and let's do something with the 7. I just want to take a look at it here for a second. First of all, this 7 is the same thing as 7 times 1, which is the same thing as 7 times x to the 0. So technically, if I wanted to, I could actually come up here and say, well, there's Actually, this is 7x to the 0. So when I do my power rule, there is an x there, but it was had an original exponent of 0. So I'm going to add 1 to my exponent, so 1. And I'm going to divide by it, 1. And when I integrate this thing, I end up with x squared plus 7x, which is what we originally had. x squared plus 7x. x squared plus 7x. But if you notice, each of these also had some sort of constant that was after it. So which constant does this particular integral relate to? The reality is we don't know. We don't know which one it is. So because of that, at the end of it, we always put, it could be any constant number. In this case, the constant number was negative one. This constant number was positive three. It could have been any constant number because when you take the derivative of a constant number, it is zero. So what we say to do is, and let's just put plus c or plus a constant number. Could have represented any constant number. So when we do our integral, we always want to put, at least an indefinite integral, we always want to put plus c at the end of it. These are called indefinite integrals or antiderivatives. So what we're going to do is we're going to play with a few of these here just for the fun of it. All right, we're going to play with you a few of these just for the fun of it. Some antiderivatives. So let me throw a couple at you here. What if I give you something like, oh, let's try x squared minus 2x plus 3. I would like to know what the antiderivative or the indefinite integral would be for this. And let's also try, how about the square root of x plus 7. All right. Why don't you guys go ahead and pause the video and see what you can do with these. All right, let's see how you did. First up, I'm going to always start off by constant number. I just got to remember that this is technically an x to the 0 here. So I'm going to take my x. I'm going to add 1 to the exponent and then divide by it. I'm going to take my minus 2x. Remember, that had an exponent of 1. So I'm going to add 1 to my numer 
one to my exponent, two, and then I'm going to divide by it. My three x to the zero, so I'm going to add one to my exponent, and then I'm going to divide by it. And then we have our constant value, plus c. So when everything's all said and done, I end up with one third x cubed minus x squared plus 3x plus c. All right, on this next one, I'm hoping you guys started off by turning it into an exponent. So x plus 7 to the 1 half. And if you notice, guys, again, all the only rule we have for antiderivatives is the power rule. You're going to hear this many times as we go through. There is no chain rule. There's no product rule. There's no quotient rule. Those are all only for derivatives. For indefinite integrals, all we have is a power rule. And some of your folks are going to be like, oh, that's awesome. Uh, yes and no. So we're going to add 1 to our 1 half, so that makes it 3 halves. And then we're going to divide by that new exponent. So divide by 3 halves. And remember, friends, dividing by a fraction is the same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal. So x plus 7 to the 3 halves. All right. And we're doing some just indefinite integrals. Uh, let's try a couple more just for the fun of it, right? Let's try a couple more just for the fun of it. Really kind of make sure we have this down. And remember, again, I can't say this enough. You can only use the power rule. Only use the power rule. So let's see here. Oh, x plus 1. squared dx. And let's try this one. x plus 7 root x. Alrighty. All right. Oh. Hey, you know what? Let me add one more here just for the fun of it. Let's try 2x minus 1 and 3x plus 1. All righty, friends. Why don't you guys pause the video and see what you guys can do with it. All right, let's see how you did Again, remember what I said, and you're going to hear this time and time and time again. There, all we have is the power rule. So I can bring a 3 out, just like with a derivative. I can bring um, any scalar multiply multiplication out in front on an integral. And then from this, since I only have a power rule, I'm going to go ahead and expand it. Now, I could do a straight power rule with that because there is it is a x plus 1, but just as a good practice, it is good to multiply them together. Because once I've done that, I can integrate whatever's left. So three times x, add one to my exponent, and divide by that new exponent. Better put a one here and x to the zero there. Two x, add one to my exponent, and divide by the new exponent. Plus one, x to the first, and divide by my new exponent. And then we have a plus c. So when I distribute everything in and clean it up, I end up with x cubed plus 3x squared, plus 3x, plus c. 
All right, on the next one, remember what we said, no product rule. Since there's no product rule, I gotta multiply these out ahead of time. So 6x squared, if I multiply this all the way out, I get a minus x there and a minus one. And notice friends, it's going to be the same thing over and over again. So add in my terms here. All righty. So six X, I'm gonna add one to my exponent and I'm gonna divide by it. Minus, add one to my exponent and I divide by it. Minus one x to the add one to my exponent and divide by it. So two x cubed minus one half x squared minus x plus c. All righty friends, let's see here the next one. Again, we don't have we don't have a quotient rule. So let's think of this instead of root x, let's think of it as x to the one half. And let's divide each term by it. So x to the first divided by x to the one half, that'd be x to the one half. Plus seven x to the negative one half. All right, so that is gonna be friends what we do our power rule from I kind of like this only one rule i can do one rule so add one to our exponent and then divide by it add one to the exponent one half and divide by it plus c so we end up then with two thirds, x to the three halves, plus two times seven, that's gonna be 14, 14 x to the one half plus c. So these are indefinite integrals. And we can do the same thing with some of our trig rules that we learned as well. So let's go ahead and delete this here. And let's throw some trig up there just for the fun of it. Oh, let's see here. We learned before that the derivative of sine is cosine. So that means then that the integral of cosine would be equal to sine. You kind of see how this plays out? When it comes to trig, they just undo each other. For instance, what about this one? The derivative of cosine Oh, that was a little, got a little haywire. Is negative sine. But the integral of sine is negative cosine. Why is that negative there? Because remember, this negative right here, you notice it's missing. So if I multiply my sign by negative one, then I've got to multiply the outside by negative one, which is where that negative comes from. That's actually one of the things that gets kind of people caught the most is they keep in sine and cosine, the derivative and integral straight on them. So you got to be make sure you're careful on that. And let's see what else do we have here. How about the derivative? of secant squared uh, tangent x
is secant squared. And I'm not going to go through and do all of these here. I'm just going to just show you a few, just so you know how it works. And then we'll, then we'll try a couple. So then when I undo it, the in integral of secant squared x would be 10x plus c. So again, we're just going to be undoing. So if we undo the other ones as well, then we'd have cosecant squared would be negative cotangent. Um, if we had secant tangent, that would be secant. Well, I made a mistake up there, didn't I? I should have been dx right there. And our last one, the cosecant cotangent. So all our trig rules are still in play. It's just we're, again, we're doing the antiderivative. So it is the opposite. We just undo it. So how does this work for trig? Well, let's, well, let's try one. Let's see how. Let's see what it would look like. Say I give you, let's go with, oh, let's go with four sine x. What would that be? Well, to begin with, bring the four out because we don't need it inside. So we have four times the integral of sine x dx. And when we do the antiderivative of that, that's four times negative cosine x plus whatever constant goes at the back. Because in all these plus c's, these are what we call general solutions because we don't know the specific case of what it is. We're just com coming up with a generality of what it could be. I don't know. Could be any constant value at the end of these. We just don't know. I want you, let's give you guys a couple to try here as well. How about this one? Figure out what secant squared x minus cosecant squared x. And let's also have you guys try, let's see here, just for the fun of it. Uh, let's do a cosine x. Minus cosecant cotangent. All righty. Go for it, friends. Go and pause the video and see if you guys can't take a stab at what these might be. Go for it. All right. So to begin with, I'm going to change this to a plus negative. So when I'm dealing with it, first thing I see is I see a, a secant. I'm taking the integral of secant squared x. Well, secant squared x, that was tangent. And then after that, I'm looking at it and I see that I'm taking the integral of negative cosecant squared x. That's your negative cosecant squared x. Well, that's the negative, but the cosecant squared x is a negative cotangent. Let's see. So when I put it all together, I get tan x. minus plus cotangent x plus c. And let's see, let's try this one too here. C 
Cosine, that would be sine. I don't need to do the minus, I'm gonna go ahead and leave it as that. So we did the cosine. And now I'm gonna deal with the cosine, cosecant cotangent. Well, that was a negative cosecant. Plus C. Never, ever, ever, ever forget plus the C. Think of your best friend whose name is C. Invite them to anywhere you go. Never forget that person. Plus cosecant X plus C. All right. So we can do integrals, antiderivatives with any expression as long as we can expand it and only use the power rule. And we can do our trick things as well. So all these plus C's that we're dealing, we said these are what we call general solutions. So general solutions for an integral. You know you're dealing with that because you're always going to have a plus C at the end of it. What if we wanted to find a particular solution? That's a particular solution is when we would actually need to figure out how to determine the actual value of C. In order to do that, we would need to have some point on that function. So, this, friends, is what we're going to try to do here. Let me give you a problem. We'll see if we can't figure it out. Let's go back to that original derivative we looked at the, at the very beginning. Given f prime of x equals 2x plus 7, find the particular solution to f of x. So we're going to integrate. Given f of 1 equals 11. Notice they had to tell us a value on the integral. Not on the integral, on the function itself. So, first thing we, ever, we want to do on these kind of things is we want to figure out what f of x is. So to find out what f of x is, we are going to undo the derivative. We are going to do the antiderivative of the derivative. We're going to undo it. So if we undo it, again, I'm going to call this exponent 1, and this is going to be 7x to the 0. So to undo it, I'm going to add 1 to my exponent, and then I'm going to divide by my new exponent. Add 1 to my exponent, and divide by my new exponent. So that means f of x is equal to x squared plus 7x. So there's that original parabola we had at the beginning, plus c. But now look what happened. We know a value on it. I know that 11 is y when x is 1. So we can actually go through and figure out which one we're actually dealing with. So 3 equals c so we can take it from being a general solution that has plus c to the particular solution because we now know what constant value c actually represents in this problem there we go hey let's have you guys try one Um, given f of x, or f prime of x, sorry, equals cosine of x, find the particular solution to f of x, given that f 
of pi over 2 equals 3. Given f of pi over, whoopsies, I need that to be black. There we go. f of pi over 2 equals 3. All right. Well, friends, why don't you pause the video and let's see what you guys can deal with. And when you get back, we'll take a little look see at it. All right, let's see how you did. So f of x equals the integral of cosine of x dx. Okay, so we're going to integrate it here. We can do the antiderivative. So that means f of x equals the antiderivative of cosine is sine sine of x plus c. All right, so now we got our function now. So let's plug in our three and our pi over two. And let's go and find out what that actual value would be. So 3 equals 1 plus c. So 2 equals c. Yeah, we take it from our, part our general solution that has plus c, and we can take it to the particular solution when c is 2. All right. So now, kind of getting the idea here of how this looks for going from general to particular, let's take it one step further and let's tie this final idea into particle motion. So, we know how to take it, go from position to velocity and to, then to acceleration. What if I want to go the other way? So a particle, moves along the x-axis at a velocity of v of t equals 3t squared. I'll have to go back and add that square here in a second. Minus 2t minus 5 for t greater than 0. At t equals 2, the position of the particle is x of 2 equals 1. In other words, it's at one unit. Determine the following. I'd like to know the acceleration when t equals 1. Determine if is the particle speeding up or slowing down when t equals 1. Explain. Determine the position function for the particle. And lastly, determine the position of the particle when t equals 4. All right, so friends, we're going to take a little look-see and see what we can do with this. So before we take a look, why don't you guys try to see how much of this you can do yourself. So go ahead and pause the video, and let's take a look and see what you're able to come up with. All right, friends, here we go. So part A, the acceleration. Um, Remember that acceleration is, we should use a different color. Acceleration is the derivative of velocity. So A of T equals the derivative of velocity. So we end up with 6T minus 2. 
So the acceleration when it's one is six times one minus two, which is four. All right, part B said, is it speeding up or slowing down? Well, I know what the acceleration is. What I don't know yet is the velocity. So we're gonna have to go figure that out real quickly. So three times one squared, minus two times one, minus five. And I get a negative four for that one. So that means the velocity of one is less than zero, but the acceleration of one is greater than zero. Now, if they just ask me, is the velocity speeding up or slowing down? Well, we'd have to, or is the velocity increasing or decreasing? That would be ba just based on the acceleration. So the acceleration is positive, so the velocity is increasing. However, that doesn't mean it's speeding up. We compare the two. And if the two signs are different, then it's slowing down. If they're the same, then it is speeding up. So in this case, the particle is slowing down at t equals one because the velocity of one is less than zero and the acceleration of one is greater than zero. They have opposite signs. All right. So now we get to the position function. So let's think of this in terms of antiderivatives. So the position function, that is the integral of velocity because we are going backwards. So I'm going to integrate my velocity equation to take it back to position. I'm not going to put dx here. This is dt. I'm doing it with respect to time this time. All right, so here we go. So 3t cubed plus or divided by 3 minus, oh, I forgot to do something kind of important here. That's a 1, and this is t to the 0. And again, guys, I'm if you are no longer doing that, that is totally good. You don't have to do that. I just do it at the beginning to kind of show where all these numbers come from. So my exponent goes to two and I'm dividing by two. And let's see here, my exponent goes to one and I'm dividing by one. And I have my plus C. So that means my position function, my general position function, it's not the specific one, not the particular one. But my general position function is T cubed minus t squared minus 5t plus c. And then I go back and realize I know my position when t equals 2. So I'm going to plug in 11. I lied. 1. Let's try that. And then whenever I see my t value, I'm going to plug in 2. And I can use that now to figure out what is my particular position function for this problem. So we got our two going in. So one equals eight minus four minus 10 plus c. So 1 equals a negative 6 plus c. And that means c is 7. So our particular solution for this problem is x of t equals t cubed minus t squared minus 5t plus 7. All righty. Now our final part here, to figure out what the position would be when time is four. So now we've got our specific equation, literally just plugging it in now, friends. So we plug four in for t, we can figure out what that particular position would be then when time is four. 
We plug everything in here. And X of four then is 64 minus 16 minus 20 plus seven. So X of four is going to be 48, 28, 35, friends, 35. So when time is P is four, our position would be 35. So, all right, that gives you a little start on what an antiderivative is. And we'll talk more about it. We'll talk more about it tomorrow in class. So take care and I'll talk to you guys then.